For the longest time, my parents never let me go downstairs into our basement. They never told me why. And they would just say, Brian, never go down into the basement. Do you understand? As a small child, I naturally just said yes and listened to my parents. But as I grew older, a raging curiosity grew within me and I always did wonder deep down what was inside of our basement. When I turned 13, my parents announced that I was finally allowed to stay home alone by myself. They trusted me to be alone and said that I was becoming a fine young man. On a Friday morning, my parents left to go on a work business trip, leaving me home alone for the first time. They said goodbye to me at the front door and my dad bent down and gave me one last reminder saying, Son, do not go downstairs into the basement. We trust you. Now watch over the house while we're gone. I told them I promised I would not go into the basement and that I would take good care of the house while they were gone. All the while, having my fingers crossed behind my back. When I saw my parents backing out of the driveway and driving off down the street, I knew that this was my chance. I grabbed the key that they kept underneath the kitchen sink and went to unlock the basement door. Part of me felt bad for disobeying a direct order from my parents, but the buildup of curiosity that I had for such a long time overrode that disappointment. I put the key into the lock and turned it. The basement door slowly opened. A giddy-like feeling rose in my stomach, and I excitedly made my way down into the basement for the first time in my life. It was dark down there, very dark. When I got to the bottom of the steps, I noticed that there was no windows for sunlight, so I pulled out my cell phone to help see. I clicked on my flash and scanned the basement area. It was empty, completely and utterly empty. I looked around the basement in disappointment. If there was nothing down here, why were my parents so adamant about me not coming down here? I was about to turn around and head back up the stairs when I heard what sounded like a soft moan coming from one of the dark corners. I shined my light into the corner that I thought I heard the noise coming from. As I took a few steps closer to that corner, my flashlight revealed something that I was not expecting to see. Not expecting at all. There, in the dark corner of my basement, were both my parents tied up with a rope and duct tape. My light flashed on their panicking eyes. They were wiggling and trying to break free from the rope and duct tape. I stared in horror. This did not make any sense. How could my parents possibly be down here in the basement when they had just left 10 minutes earlier? I was about to go over and start untying them when I heard the basement door open up and heavy footsteps coming down the stairs. I turned around and in utter horror, I saw my parents coming down the stairs. My brain could not comprehend what I was seeing, and I was speechless. Here were my parents coming down the basement stairs, and at the same time, they were also tied up in the corner. How was this possible? Oh, sweetie, my mother said, who was now standing at the bottom of the steps next to my dad. I watched in horror as my parents who stood at the bottom of the stairs transformed into something utterly grisly and horrifying. It was worse than any monster from a nightmare that I ever had. The creatures who had pretended to be my parents took a step towards me and one of them said, Son, we told you not to go downstairs into the basement. It was midnight and I stumbled out of the bar drunk. Even though I was hammered, I had the presence of mind not to get into my car and drive home. Instead, I called an Uber to pick me up. I got into the Uber. My head was pounding, but I was thankful that I had made the right decision not to drive. The Uber driver pulled off, and me being drunk, I tried to be nice and start a conversation. I asked how his night was going, and if he was busy, and other questions like that. But the driver didn't say a word. I was getting the vibe that he did not want to talk. I took the hint and pulled out my phone to keep me occupied until I got home. I started to scroll through Instagram when I got a text message from Uber saying that my ride has arrived. 
This was strange, because I was currently in my Uber ride, and we had been driving for at least 10 minutes. And then, even in my drunken state, I realized the grave mistake that I had made. I tried to pull the back door open, but when I did, all the doors electronically locked at once. Terrified, I screamed at the driver to let me out, but when I looked into the rearview mirror, the driver's eyes were wide open and unblinking with a sinister smile. The car began to accelerate. The man driving turned around and said, You're not going anywhere. You're mine now. The following is a true story. I grew up in a small town right outside the Pocono Mountains. It was a town where everybody knew everybody. In the summer of 1998, a little girl named Emily suddenly went missing. Her parents stated in the police report that they put Emily to bed and when they woke up the next morning, she was suddenly gone. The entire police force was sent on the case to find Emily. And since it was such a small town, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers offered to help the police look for her. She was beloved by the community. After two weeks of not finding Emily, people started to assume the worst. But then, one Sunday morning, a group of volunteers who were searching the Pocono Mountains discovered something very bizarre. They had stumbled upon a tiny cave on the side of the mountain, and when they went inside of it, they had discovered Emily. She was alive, but when they found her, she was at the very back of the cave, sitting and facing the wall, her head down and her hair covering her face. When one of the volunteers grabbed her and turned her around, they nearly passed out. Emily's eyes were completely white. There was no pupils, no irises, nothing. One of the volunteers who had discovered her said her eyes looked like bowls of milk. The volunteers who had found her quickly rushed her to the hospital. The doctors ran tests and all her bodily functions were completely normal, but they could not explain how her eyes went completely white. It wasn't natural at all. And what was even stranger, Emily was now completely mute. She would not speak a word and hasn't said one since she's been discovered. She was taken to an institution to run brain scans and other tests to see if they could figure out what was wrong with her. They couldn't because all Emily would do was stare at a wall with those blank white eyes and not say a word. Her parents, while happy that their daughter was returned, were still devastated because of her condition. To this day, police cannot explain how she went missing from her bed that one night and wound up in a cave more than 40 miles from her house. They can't explain why her eyes are now pure white and why she's completely mute it's one of the most bizarre cases that I've ever heard of, and it happened in my hometown. So please, if you have any explanation as to how this happened, or know of similar cases, let me know. Thank you. When I was 15 years old, our family dog Scooter ran away. We were devastated. We put up missing flyers all around town and even made a Facebook group to bring him home. But after many months of searching, we never found Scooter and eventually gave up. I remember crying myself to sleep many nights because of the pain. But eventually, our parents bought us a new dog, Rocky. He was a baby golden retriever. And even though my heart still panged for Scooter, seeing how cute Rocky was definitely helped the healing process. Then, one summer afternoon when my family and I were out in our backyard playing with Rocky, we saw a stray dog running towards us in the distance. As the dog got nearer, I could not believe my eyes. It was Scooter. It had been over a year since Scooter had been missing, and here he was, sprinting towards us in our backyard. I broke down in tears as Scooter came up to me and started licking my face. He rolled on his back wanting us to give him belly rubs. Our family was so ecstatic. It was like a miracle that he returned home. That was until the first night. I woke up about two in the morning. There was a violent scratching from my bedroom door. I sat up in bed, concerned. 
I walked to my door about to open it, when I heard a very violent growl. I hesitantly opened my door, just a crack, and in horror, I saw Scooter standing there, his teeth and fangs flaring. There was foam coming out of his mouth, and his eyes looked wild. I shut my door and put my chair in front of it and hid under my covers. I fell asleep terrified. The next morning, I told my parents about what Scooter had done, but they said he was gone for so long, who knows what happened to him out there. Right now, the best thing we can do for Scooter is to give him love. As much as I wanted to love Scooter, I couldn't get over how menacing he was last night. He almost seemed demonic, but things got much worse. The next night, around 2 in the morning, I woke up, but this time, it wasn't because of my door being scratched, it was because an animal was howling in terrified agony. My whole family woke up to the screaming. We sprinted downstairs to where the screaming was coming from. My dad flicked on the kitchen lights. What we saw still haunts my dreams to this day. There, on the kitchen floor was Rocky, or I should say, what was left of him. Scooter was on top of Rocky's dead carcass, blood and flesh dangling from his jaws. He barked violently at us, as if warning us to get back. My dad ended up calling animal control, and it took three men to restrain Scooter. One of the men was even bitten pretty badly. The next morning, we found out they had put Scooter down. He was too violent. I often find myself wondering how this all came about. Before Scooter ran away, he was the most peaceful, loving dog around. He wouldn't even hurt a squirrel or a bird. What happened to him when he ran away? Why when he came back was he... different? The best way I could describe his energy was violent, on the point of demonic. We came to a family decision, no more dogs. Quite frankly, we were too afraid to ever have one again.